astrology. Uh, we played with Bernoulli. We get it down to a point where we have all these numbers. If you don't know the number, cancel it out. Assume it's zero, that kind of thing. And, um, and represent um, all the factors that you have. You have the area of, of this circle. You have your change in elevation. That's your change in elevation. You have your, this is your gravitational constant, 32.2. Uh, and so you can get, you can get the, from this elevation, you can get the flow into these pipes. Now the C, oh, um, a really good entrance condition, a really good pipe, you know, it could be 0 0.7, 0 0.8, a really bad one could be 0 0.4, 0 0.5. You can go, uh, you can go to a book and, and get those, uh, those formulas. Guys did millions of experiments to figure out what the C is for pretty much everything. And that's called an empirical number. That's because it's not, it doesn't come from all sorts of mathematics. It comes from experimentation, and and they they solved everything and came up with some good C values here. And that's the, that's the only empirical part of that formula. Now there are there are several other formulas that are derived or semi-derived, and that that one is for orifice flow, you know, getting water in, into an orifice, and almost always that orifice flow is going to dictate how much water you're going to get through that pipe. That pipe could be at a great slope, um, but usually the dictating factor is entrance condition, how much, how much you can get in there. Um, another big one that we use all the time, and we'll, we'll skip the mathematics, let's just go flow over a weir. Flow is equal to CLH to the three halves. That's flow over a weir, usually a sharp crested weir. And this, a lot of this has been derived from Bernoulli and from equations. When you see these really nice exponents and things like that, um, you know that that part of it is derived. When you come up to a coefficient, um, you know that, that that's something they derived empirically. They did a lot of experimentation. So for C, on the best, best sharp crested wheel you could ever have, C is going to be 3.3. Uh, a normal sharp crested wheel, a normal wheel in operation, if you're going to use this equation a lot, use 3.0. That's going to get you close to where you want to be. And if you're dealing with a broad crested weir where there's other hydraulics involved, the C can get down to a 2.7. But in normal operations, think 3.0 when you're thinking CLH to the 3 halves. And this is an equation you can use in the field also. You know, you see a foot of water going over, and that's great if there's a foot of water going over a weir, uh, a 10-foot weir, so it's C length is 10, H is 1, C is 3. How much water we got going over that weir? 30. 30 CFS. That, that's it. And that's easy because 1 to the 3 has power is going to be 1. But it would say in the field if, uh, if H is 3. You say, how am I going to do that? In, in the field, you can just cube, cube it first, 3 cubed, and then take the square root. So you can actually do um, 3 half powers in the field. And again, this, this, this was largely derived from mathematics and then all the... Um, Fudge factor. The fudge factor is in there with the C. Um, feet per second. And that comes out in CFS. Yep. A yep. uh, last one, well, is a triangular weir. Again, that is that is um, derived the same kind of way. It's equal to a K factor times H to the five halves. That's for a, a, a triangular weir. And you can you can go in your hydrology hydrology textbook and get your different values for per K. Now let's say a flume. We've dealt with, uh, we, we deal with flumes a lot. And, and flumes are great because flumes, entrance to a flume, um, the method there is get the water into uh, a subcritical state, deep, um, slow, not a lot of momentum, so that the water basically falls into your flume, and at the flume, at the measuring point, the, the critical point, it goes critical. And then the bottom of the, fl the flume, the water comes out supercritical, and then eventually jumps back up to a subcritical method like, like it does in a rapid in a river. And so the key to a flume is, is getting it to there where it's, it's critical flow, and you're measuring the critical depth, and it can only have one, one depth for that. It's not subcritical. It's not supercritical. It's, it, you measure it at the critical point. And, 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 and for flumes, they're all so different that, that they, um, they come up with some, some basic derived formulas, but most of it is empirical. For example, for flume width, a throat width um, between 2 and 8 feet, the equation for a flume is 4B, B is the width, 
times the height, that's the elevation that you're measuring in your flume, to the 1.58 V with V to the 0 0.026 factor. And we can see that you know, a lot of this is probably derived, these kind of numbers are what they, they, they get in the laboratory and they, they, have, they have empirical relationships for that. So any, any flume that you have uh, between 2 and 8, this equation will work. For smaller throats, the, the less than 2 feet, um, there are several different equations because side friction comes into play. Um, there's a lot of other things involved. And so um, those are some of the basic um, plug and shove formulas that you can use in everyday work in the field, in the office, to, to estimate flows. Um, and we talk, talked about the flume, and the flume, I, I think, is, is a great application. We talk about this mysterious subcritical and supercritical flow, and, and, and we see it all the time in nature. We see it in rapids as a supercritical flow. It's called choking flow. When a river, river chokes, it's, it, it goes faster. It, go, it flows thinner. Or if there's debris, if there's sediment put into a river, the water will go over that sediment and go supercritical for a while, and then go, go back to a, a more efficient energy uh, system and eventually jump up and become subcritical. So it goes through that rapid really quickly and then jumps up again um, and, and becomes, becomes even deeper than that. And that's what that, why that jump at the end of a rapid uh, creates um, enough head for water to circle back around and create some of the eddies that we see around, around rapids. Um, but the neat, neat thing, um, oh, um, two great things that, that, that we've just discussed. Um, we're, we, we talked about weir flow and we talked about orifice flow. Some people in dams use orifices for spillways. Some people use um, weirs. Um, and again, the weir, weir equation, again, Chuck, was P squared over 2G. Close. <laughs> to three halves, right? Two halves. That's, that's two a weir. Um, uh, an orifice is CA radical 2GH, right? 2GH, yeah. So this one is not quite squared, and this one is, is a square root. So we look at a um, a graph of what these things would do, say this is head, you know, one foot, five feet, and this is flow, this is Q, um, one CFS, ten CFS, that kind of thing. Um, one, one graph will look like this. As you, go, as you increase in head, you have a rapid increase in flow, and that would be our weir flow, because it's almost like squaring. Right? The exponent is, a, is greater than 1, you get this kind of action. So a little bit ahead on a weir gives you a lot more flow, and that's why weir are so much more efficient than, say, the pipe flow. So this, the pipe flow thing, we're taking the square root of the head. That's bad. So that fairly quickly in, in the calculations, you'll see that adding a lot of head is not going to give you much, much more flow out of it. So that's why in dam safety, we use a lot of a, a lot of weir overflow spillways, and, and any kind of design you're doing with canals or anything like that, um, if you can focus on weirs, it's going to give you a lot more capacity in, in almost every situation. And it's not going to get clogged, that's correct. Um, and just, yeah, just another, um, uh, another explanation of um, the critical versus the supercritical. Um, you can tell something in the field. You can tell if you have if you have critical flow. If you th throw a rock in it, and you know when you throw a rock in the lake, there there are rings that, that expand upstream and downstream. Downstream. You throw a rock in subcritical flow. There's backwater effects, and so those rings will perpetuate upstream and downstream. 